Marco Mangelsdorf here, Energy 808, the cutting edge. Really pleased with uh, much gratitude to have Ivan Penn from the New York Times, one of the best energy beat writers, I dare say, in the country and uh, has been covering the energy beat for the Times over these past years. So uh, welcome to uh, Energy 808 ThinkTech. So it's great to have you, Ivan. It's a pleasure to join you, Marco. Well, let's uh, let's take take the dive by starting. Um, I'm always really interested and curious when I talk to uh, a guest, kind of how how they got to the chair they're sitting in now, as far as uh, well. In your case, uh, the reporting path. Uh, I believe I read that you've been a reporter for for decades. So let uh, you know start wherever you'd like to, to start, and uh, kind of tell me more about uh, how how the Ivan Pen of today came to be the Ivan Pen of today. Uh, well, um, uh, there's a lot of interesting components to that, but um, what brought me in particular to the the energy space, uh, I, I've been covering uh, utilities and energy for about 15 years or so. Uh, I've been a reporter for, uh, I guess it's 31 years, um, with a career that's gone from uh, the Miami Herald to the Baltimore Sun uh, the St. Pete, now Tampa Bay Times, the Los Angeles Times, uh, and now the New York Times, um, and based in Los Angeles. Uh, it was at the Tampa Bay Times that I began to cover energy after largely a career that focused on government, politics, uh, criminal justice. And uh, I was asked to cover utilities <laughs> uh, at the Tampa Bay Times. And um, there was a broken nuclear plant uh, that uh, was 70 miles north of Tampa. And um, reporting on how that plant broke, really, um, it, it, that's what led me into almost really making this a, uh, a career of covering utilities and energy. Uh, the, the utility company there had um, done a project uh, replacing steam generators that led to uh, damaging the plant. and. Um, so since then, uh, the LA Times hired me uh, to be their energy reporter. And then the New York Times uh, hired me as, uh, the title is Alternative Energy Correspondent. Um, I get harangued on Twitter over that title because uh, <laughs> uh, people like to say, well, solar is not alternative anymore. And I'm not the solar solar reporter. I'm uh, the the title is alternative energy, um, but I, I cover basically the electricity sector uh, and the power grid, um, along with uh, my colleague Cliff Krauss in Houston, who covers oil, natural gas, and coal. Uh, we're the energy correspondents um, uh, for the New York Times on the business staff, uh, and another colleague in in Europe, uh, Stanley Reed, who covers energy there. Um, but uh, that's sort of the essence of how I got to the space. Great, I uh, so appreciate kind of hearing how your, your path and uh, just out of curiosity, do you have an idea of kind of what the cohort size is of, of national reporters whose principal beat is the energy slash utility sector? I'm just kind of get, trying to get a sense because I, 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 of course, read up on this quite a bit, have been for years, kind of get a sense of how big you, you feel your your cohort is that covers this particular beat. Do you have a sense of that? Well, so it's interesting. Um, before uh, President Biden uh, pushed the energy transition, um, you know, there wasn't the level of interest, uh, even even as you know, folks would talk about climate change. Um, people didn't necessarily, especially at mainstream news organizations. Uh, want to cover utilities <laughs> and energy um maybe oil uh and and gas um but electricity wasn't exactly um there weren't a whole lot of folks and you know and some of the uh, you know bit of the obvious uh so I, when you start talking about particularly african american journalists who are business reporters and cover energy that they that world is really small um, the, uh, the, the mainstream media reporters who cover utilities and energy, um, you know, has grown 
uh, but it's still a relatively small group. I mean, you'll have more climate and environmental reporters, um, but those who particularly cover utilities and energy, not not a lot. Um, uh, there, w- several of us we do know each other uh, at, in competing news organizations, um, and uh, you know it's because it's poles and wires aren't aren't uh, as sexy as politics and Hollywood and uh, you know things that um, that generally dominate the front pages and the top of the news hour, um, but because of the energy transition, a lot of that has changed. And my Marco addendum to that is that uh, yeah, people don't pay a whole lot of attention to poles and wires and electrons until something rather dramatic happens that threatens the availability of that. It's kind of the Joni Mitchell that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. In this case, you know, power to do what you need to do. So let's let's just take the dive into your recent reporting on the Lahaina fire, tragically um, the worst thing that the state of, has uh, experienced uh, since statehood. And you, along with other Times reporters and many others, uh, national and local, have been covering this story from multiple angles. And uh, I've read all your stuff. And uh, kind of what stands out to you in your reporting over the past couple of weeks about the uh, the fire, the, the possible causes, going electric, all of the above. Yeah, the the thing that struck me from uh, the the very beginning is, um, you know, here we have again questions of uh, utility preparedness for extreme events that are becoming more more common. Um, when when we really look at the picture, we have an electric grid that's uh, well over 100 years old. And in many cases, that grid all across the country um, hasn't been upgraded to meet not only the clean energy challenges of uh, rooftop solar, batteries in garages, um, and you know electric vehicles, but the climate events that are driving the energy transition. And uh, so what we began to to see in our reporting um, were some similarities uh, to things that we've reported on uh, on the mainland. Um, questions about the uh, w- were the electric poles, the power lines, uh, were they uh, up to date and uh, were they the sources of these deadly fires? Uh, is once again, we we saw in particularly in, here in California, it was uh, electrical equipment that uh, failed. Particularly, uh, the biggest one was a transmission tower that failed and caused the campfire, um, and you know that killed eighty five people. Uh, so we started seeing uh, some evidence from particularly one company called Whisker Labs, uh, they have home sensors that detected uh, some what they call faults and arcing on, on, the, on the power lines. So in, in those cases, um, you, you see drops in voltage and, and ultimately um, potential sparking. And if you've got a lot of dry brush, that can trigger a fire. So a lot of attention, of course, has turned to that area. And and that has been, you know, a consistent focal focal point of the wildfires in California, and and increasingly in other places uh, around the states. So that's uh, that that's what those were the most striking things um, from the beginning. Now, there's been um, you mentioned the campfire, which is getting a lot of uh, a play, uh, so to speak, as far as people referring back to that last uh, terrible fire 2018 in california and uh, many pieces i've seen have brought uh, pg e into the course of the discussion and from your perspective i'm wondering what what do you feel are the parallels or lack thereof between let's say what happened uh with pg e and what you're we're witnessing so far with uh, the fires uh, on maui and, and hawaiian electric well, I, I, of course, the, the first thing that people started thinking, because uh, when you start looking at the 
the potential cost uh, of recovery uh, in the in the billions of dollars, and then that's weighed against uh, the the value of Hawaiian Electric. Um, the first thing people start thinking about is uh, is the utility going to have to go into bankruptcy, uh, as we saw with uh, PG and E, and um, when you start thinking about it in that context, uh, you know these are so you have multiple things that people are looking at in the comparison. One obviously is uh, potentially uh, utility equipment causing a fire, uh, resulting in scores of deaths, um, and a utility uh, so overburdened uh, with liability that uh, it may have to seek bankruptcy protection in order uh, to handle it all. Um, just to give a little context for the comparison, with PG&E, part of the issue was not only the campfire, but it was multiple fires, uh, including some that sort of preceded a uh, the string of what, um, what some related to uh, the kind of climate change explosion of the wildfires uh, beginning in 2017. PG&E was already trying to resolve previous wildfires, and then suddenly uh, they have this string that uh, began in 2017, um, the, the most deadly, devastating one, the campfire in 2018. And as a way to manage all of this, they, they took uh, the bankruptcy route uh, because they had all of these court cases uh, they were beginning to deal with. So um, a akin to that, Hawaiian Electric uh, now is looking at having to manage a series of lawsuits that have been filed on the behalf of victims. And you have the uniqueness of Hawaii, um, where you have different islands, and unlike the mainland, where you have connections to the grid throughout a state and even across state borders. Hawaii has uh, separate grids on, on the different islands. Uh, so they're all acting independently, which creates you know, another set of, of issues for Hawaiian Electric to manage, in addition to those, uh, the multiple suits uh, that, that keep getting filed. Um, so a lot of parallels. Um, and and then you know a significant difference in uh, that um, Hawaiian Electric has separate grids that it has to deal with. Um, that's a that's a unique situation. I would, um, in fact, yeah, which which don't have underwater cables, uh, as we all know, and probably not going to happen in my lifetime, nor probably in yours. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, from from your take. Just um, it's a little bit of background. So I, I've heard it from a number of, of sources, and I read it in uh, Katie Blunt's book on PG&E, that they're one of the issues with PG&E, and it's also been put out there with Wine Electric, is that maybe their focus over the years was so heavy and so pronounced on renewable energy development that that kind of took up so much oxygen in the room, so to speak, that it left other priorities uh, lower on the list. Do you, do you find any merit in that, that somehow, in this case of Hawaiian Electric, that maybe they too were so somehow uh, preoccupied with renewables that uh, other important priorities were, were not ignored, but just that were given the same level of uh, uh, urgency to, to do something? Well, that may be the case, but, um, you know, there's a bottom line when it comes to the regulated utilities, and that is they have a very clear mission. It is to produce safe, reliable, and affordable electricity. That is their core mission. And so everything else um, is supposed to be subordinate to that. Uh, even as you're developing a clean energy profile, um, those, the, those things are supposed to stand out in the forefront. Uh, again, you know, doing the, the PG&E comparison, I mean, one of the things that we found in our reporting was that there was an enormous amount of uh, spending on executive pay, uh, on uh, shareholder um, uh, 
pay, you know, rewarding the shareholders um, and and not maintaining their equipment. Because again, that campfire, so the tower that broke was 100 years old. And uh, by PG&E's own standards, it was 25 years past its useful life. So why was that tower there, um, given in particular that safety is a core and, and a universal element that utilities get um, can get funding for from regulators because it is part of their core responsibility. I've seen um, a number of utility experts just uh, raise the eyebrows, shake their heads, uh, wondering why would you not uh, make sure that your grid was stable, make sure that all of those things were taken care of because the regulators are going to approve things that, that are safety issues. Um, you can still deal with clean energy. You can still deal with solar and wind and batteries, um, but safety is a bedrock element of the core of what utilities are supposed to be doing. Yeah, no, I, I think you put it very, very well. Well, you've been, you've been an observer of utilities uh, on both the East Coast there in Florida. I, would, I, I believe you were talking about Florida Power and Light in terms of that troubled nuclear plant. Uh, certainly uh, yeah, uh, it was Progress Energy, now Duke Energy. Okay, okay. Thank you for that correction. So uh, Progress Energy and PG&E and... I'm wondering if you have what what your observations are in terms of how how wine electric to date over the past couple of weeks has kind of done in terms of what I'll call you know crisis management. I mean, there's a whole whole kind of subcategory of PR you know that deals with nothing but uh, dealing with crises uh, when it befalls a, a company. So, what, what's your kind of impression as to how wine electric has done to handle the the, the very, very difficult, obviously, tragic situation on Maui. Well, as you noted, uh, it is a difficult situation. Um, you, you know, I, I, I guess it will forever be comparisons with, between the, the Hawaiian Electric and PG&E. Um, but in uh, perhaps in, in all fairness to Hawaiian Electric, um, you know, they don't have the, the, the numbers of, of people especially uh, on communications staff and all as a PG&E. PG&E is not only California's largest investor-owned utility, but it is the largest utility within the borders of any state in the country. Um, and so that's a massive operation. And even for them, responding to the, um, uh, the barrage of of uh, questions from both the local media, uh, the national media, and then ultimately international media. Um, I mean, it's it's a lot, right? I mean, that, that that's that that's you know, I think being real. Um, at the same time, you know, I mean, it it also becomes your responsibility, um, and you know, we have to ask tough questions, um, and the the public has. Or right to know what happened. Um, sometimes, you know, they're balancing. Okay, we're also being sued. <laughs> so, um, how do we respond to the questions that uh, you, Ivan Penn, are asking, and your colleagues um, uh, against the backdrop of um, a series of lawsuits and uh, potential, you know, penalties from regulators? Uh, and then, you know, you're also dealing with the state government, the, the legislature, the governor. You're dealing with all of those elements at the same time that you're, um, you know, being asked to be responsive. And that's, and that's difficult. Um, but, you know, that's also your job. So speaking of a barrage of questions, uh, kind of a similar question I'll ask you regarding how what I'll call the Hawaii political class has dealt with this. I mean, Governor Josh Green is uh, relatively new in the chair, so to speak. Uh, same with uh, Richard Bisson, mayor, county of Maui. And they've been holding multiple uh, meetings before the press. Do, do you have any sense of kind of how you would grade them and as far as how they're handling 
uh, this well, from a... I mean, in my position, I wouldn't particularly grade, uh, offer a grade um, to maintain our, you know, uh, particularly as a reporter um, and not necessarily a columnist, um, the objectivity. Um, you know, but from the reporting that we and others have done, I mean, obviously people are deeply concerned about um, the response because they need help. Um, and uh, it, that's always going to be a challenge, especially, I mean, this is, there's a lot of really complicated issues here. I mean, we still, we have hundreds of people who still aren't accounted for. Yeah. Um, that's a, and and that affects response. Um, at the same time, again, people need and want answers as to how did we get here uh, as much as, um, you know, do something about my situation because I've got to survive right now. So you're juggling all of these pieces. Um, but first and foremost, I mean, people want to know what about my, my missing loved one? I want to know what has happened to them. Uh, what about our needs right now? We need help, um, you know. And you hear those cries, um, and and so, you know, I think that all of that ends up speaking for itself. And as of a little bit earlier today, the tally of missing was somewhere over eight hundred. So I mean, it's just kind of astonishing to me that now, you know, two weeks into it, there are still eight hundred people missing, and that they've apparently the search teams have gone through about eighty percent of of Lahaina. So um, yeah, the, the grisly work goes on. Uh, do you have a last to put on your prognosticator hat? Do you have this, uh, would you hazard a guess as to how long it's gonna take the alcohol, tobacco, firearms, the explosives, the ATF people from Washington to come up with, because um, they're on the ground there now investigating uh, the cause or possible causes of the fire. Do you have any sense of how long it's gonna take them to be able to produce something for, for the public? I, I don't know how long it'll take the ATF, um, but a lot of times, and especially given the, the kinds of data that we have, uh, a lot of times from the wildfires, um, you know, it takes a lot of work because uh, a lot of your evidence, obviously, has been uh, damaged by the fire itself. So you've got to sift through all of that. Uh, and, and again, at the same time, you're dealing with, you're still dealing with search and recovery. Uh, elements as opposed to, um, you know, uh, we haven't really moved beyond that phase yet. Um, so so you, you've got all of that going on. But at the same time, we have seen, um, you know, at, at points uh, in, in some of the California wildfires, some pretty uh, rapid uh, response times within, um, sometimes it's been, been months, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's a little unclear when you have the kind of unusual data that we have seen uh, in this case. Um, uh, you know, quite a qu quite a bit of uh, evidence uh, related to what was going on on the grid. So that may that may hasten uh, a, a determination. Well, thanks. Anything more you want to say on this subject before we uh, we shift topics? Uh, well, you know, I mean, this is um, this is going to be an an ongoing question. Uh, I've been raising um, the, the questions about our our distribution as well as transmission system. We talk a lot about the transmission system, especially in the in the energy transition. But a lot of these poles and wires that are connecting the grid to our homes, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done all throughout the country. Um, yes, we want to move solar and wind from one area to another, but uh, that equipment that connects uh, our home and our homes and businesses to the grid that also needs attention. Um, and when you start plugging a whole lot of stuff up to it, the solar panels, the batteries, the electric vehicles, you got to consider what kind of impact that that's going to have. Uh, on equipment that's 100, 125 years old. 
Well, you know, I've been at this for a very long time, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, the distributed generation uh, shift going from the Edisonian, you know, great big power plants with power lines going hundreds or thousands of miles hither and yon is certainly shifting to a very, very different model. And yet the infrastructure, the architecture is still kind of stuck in the 100 year ago uh, mold. And, and it's going to take a time and it's going to take a tremendous amount of money. Uh, to be able to to move us where we want to go. So l- let me l- l- let's go to to your piece from last year. So you wrote a what I thought was a really great piece in uh, May of last year, a long piece on Hawaii energy renewable energy. Can you uh, reach back in time and uh, kind of share the the top things that come to mind about what you learned during your 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 reporter visit here uh, in the first half of last year and what you wrote. Whenever I think about um, uh, Hawaii, I think about, um, you know, I, obviously the number one thing uh, outside of, you know, a, a disaster situation like this is the electricity rates. Um, uh, Hawaii has the highest rates in the country. And a- as we looked at, um, you know, some of the dynamics, because part of the question, especially at that time, uh, we had the the um, the beginnings of the of Russia's war in Ukraine, and uh, that caused natural gas price, prices to spike, and Hawaii, uh, you know, imports all of its fuel um, for the the fossil fuel generators. So the, there was a direct impact, and uh, learning that the renewable prices uh, were tied to um, the uh, fossil fuel <laughs> prices, uh, you 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 saw just an overall increase in the rates, uh, even as you were trying to um, you know c- clean up the grid. Uh, those were some really um, fascinating dynamics. You know, we need to rethink how we have packaged everything because there was um, not just Hawaii but all over the country some short sightedness. And how we have uh, how we have developed the grid, and this is a perfect opportunity to cite a couple of stats that just continue to kind of boggle my mind in terms of showing just how dangerously I would say and how vulnerably dependent we are, and we have been for decades and decades on it. The long, long supply line of imported fossil fuels, and for example, in 1960, 1960. 99% of the state's economy was powered by imported oil. Well, that's not too too surprising. Uh, last year, that figure, uh, despite decades of, of people working really hard to try to bring about greater energy independence, greater energy security here in Hawaii, we were still, as of last year, dependent to the tune of 80%. I've been 80% on imported fossil fuel, principally oil by far, with some of that gas. Uh, and we, we've made strides certainly in the power generation sector, but transportation is, is pretty much abysmal. I mean, there are more and more EVs, of course. But I mean, we're, we're, we're still, just blows my mind, we're still, after all these years of effort, we're still 80% dependent upon imported fossil fuels. And that's, uh, I think we should be having more of uh, those of us who have hair, you know, uh, hair on fire moments that this really necessitates something much more dramatic in the efforts than we've been up to so far, but it'll, it'll meander on as it, as it does. So in the, in the past year, so it has been something over a year since uh, that piece in May of last year. Uh, what, if anything, has uh, changed or what kind of progress you think we've made or anything that kind of comes to mind in the intervening time since you wrote that piece as far as being an observer one of the things that i i thought then and i and even in recent conversations i've had with people i thought was very interesting uh very much on the positive side of hawaiian electric was being in their control center and seeing um that they were able they were tracking the distributed uh resources that were that were coming into the grid that's actually very unique in the country. Um, many of the utilities, and especially California, you know, has the most 
rooftop solar of any state in, uh, by far. Um, the, the grid does not know how much rooftop solar is coming on to the grid at any particular time. They don't have a system in place right now to track that. So that's a really, and, and it's a, an important thing. And uh, that's a, that was a really striking thing and remains a striking thing about uh, what Hawaiian Electric is doing. Um, there's some, there are efforts to, to, to uh, begin to track that in California. Uh, PG&E is being one of those. Um, but another PG&E, uh, um, Portland General Electric, um, they have uh, a d- uh, distributed energy center that um, uh, is doing the kind of things that Hawaiian Electric um, is doing. But these are these are rare. Um, it, it's it's a, it's kind of um, it, it, you begin to wonder why are why do we not track those resources uh, which can help us uh, manage the grid better? So that was a that actually is a a good thing. Well, let's let's move to uh, to NIMBY out in my backyard, darn it. And I don't know if you were aware of this, but in the uh, not too long ago. Hawaiian Electric submitted a, a a very long plan as far as how they were going to uh, develop their grid with more renewables, and that included in their assumptions that there would be 400 megawatts of uh, wind, offshore wind on Oahu, which uh, really kind of struck me as being a rather large number because we don't have any whatsoever offshore wind in Hawaii for a number of reasons, at least to date. And you wrote a great piece on. Uh, not focused on Hawaii, but uh, the, what's going on as far as pushback against large uh, wind farms, whether onshore or offshore, and solar. So what, what do you want to share? What can you share from, from that particular piece? I mean, th- th- there's just this con- conflicting priorities here, and I get why someone doesn't want to have a, a wind turbine in their viewplane view, view or have this low-frequency hum disrupt their, their quality of life. But what, I guess what, what's your... What does your reporter, your reporting lead you to kind of surmise or conclude kind of where we are regarding those competing priorities of we want to have more renewables and at the same time there's commensurate pushback in some quarters? Well, you use the 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 perfect word um, competing. Um, Solving a lot of the uh, clean energy questions is actually not as complicated as it seems. Um, but the problem is the competing interests. Um, and because there are some who are, are arguing, well, we don't need to do all of these big uh, solar farms and wind farms uh, when we have all these rooftops of homes and businesses um, that uh, where we could put the panel, put panels on, put batteries at those locations, um, put the, the generation where the load is, um, you know, as part of is one quarter. Um, uh, another quarter argues uh, that well, if we're going to electrify everything, including transportation, heating uh, and cooling, especially in areas that um, uh, aren't aren't using electric uh, for, for HVAC, uh, when you start adding all that up, we need a whole bunch of power. Um, and more than waiting for uh, homeowners to adopt uh, rooftop solar or or businesses, and and so there's there's one point of tension, but then you also have others that that people may or may not be thinking about, uh, like the unions. Um, they're thinking about jobs. Well, a nuclear plant, you know, is six hundred jobs, um, and high paying uh, high paying kinds of jobs. A solar farm after it's built, you know, uh, well, it was a guy with a squeegee, and increasingly it's a drone. Um, so it, you you worry about jobs from a union standpoint. So the unions pull in a different direction. Um, the utilities are thinking about, well, our our profit is we get a return off of, uh, you know, they're kind of construction companies, of <laughs> stuff that they build. So if they aren't building things, then you know where is their profit going to come from? 
Uh, so there are all of those tensions that have nothing to do with types of generation themselves and whether the stuff works and all of those things. Um, and and that's that's a real challenge. Uh, but then you start talking about offshore wind, uh, and, it, you know, it, it, the, the whole country, we're, we're way behind, um, especially Europe. Um, we, we have seven turbines in the water. Uh, you know, obviously there are some others that are, that are, um, are we're getting there on, on some on the East Coast. Uh, but we only have seven where uh, Europe has thousands. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, a, that, that's a whole nother set of, of challenges, both economically, um, the NIMBY piece, people are concerned about, you know, the visual uh, aspect of the turbines in the water. They're the, the, the fisheries um, and, and the, uh, the fishing industry. Um, and what's the impact? The environmentalists worrying about uh, the whales and, um, you know, what are the impacts of having lines under the water for these turbines? So, I mean, there, there, there's a whole lot of uh, policy, po political, NIMBY, um, uh, job interests that are all competing against each other that don't necessarily have anything to do with the energy itself, um, but they are the drivers. Now, that's, these are great points you're making, and just kind of bring it back uh, to Hawaii. Ne. I mean, Oahu is the island that's really kind of in the in the more difficult straits because there's you know one million out of the states, 1.4 million who live there approximately, and uh, whereas uh, uh, the Kauai, where yeah, you see the the co-op there has been exemplary as far as bumping up their renewables, cost-effective renewables. Uh, the Big Island is number two on the list. Uh, Maui is not doing too bad, at least wasn't until what happened a couple weeks ago. But it's really Oahu, which, you know, the, the, the big bulk of the power demand is, and there's less room, there's less space. So, hence, you know, looking looking to the horizon in the ocean for, for megawatts, perhaps, of large wind turbine. Well, we could go on and on. I feel like we both, uh, we've only kind of scratched the surface here, but uh, all good things do come to an end at some point. So, uh, Ivan Penn. Uh, I can't tell you how much I really appreciate you joining me and joining us today. And uh, I hope I can have you back before too long to share all the interesting, juicy stuff that uh, you will be pro uh, reporting on from now until that next time. So uh, mahalo nui loa for joining us and uh, ThinkTech. Thank you. Thank you.